What just happened on the Euphrates River is shocking the whole world, and all Christians are researching and trying to understand what is behind this mystery on the Euphrates. Therefore, in the next few minutes, I will reveal to you the frightening connection between what is happening on the Euphrates River and apocalyptic prophecies. There is no more room for lies and deceptions, my brother. You deserve to know the truth and, allow me to be honest with you, prepare yourself because the information I am going to reveal during this video will be impactful, and you will never be the same person after watching this video. In recent times, the Euphrates River, which is extremely important and flows through Syria and Iraq, has seen its water levels decrease. Beyond these already concerning events, other more astonishing things have happened in this river. Various reports indicate that some ancient ruins hidden in a cave have started to appear. It's as if history is emerging right in front of us, wanting to warn us that something significant is about to happen. Some people look at this and think, we are close to the end. And why do they think this? Because some ancient ruins show that the end of times is near? Well, there are a few reasons for this. The first is that the Euphrates is not just any river, it is mentioned several times in the Bible and has a very special meaning. To give you an idea, the Euphrates is one of the four rivers that, according to the Bible, flowed through the Garden of Eden, that paradise where, according to the story, humanity began. And guess what? This whole region, where the Euphrates and Tigris are today, was known as Mesopotamia, or, land between rivers, and is extremely important for understanding various ancient stories. This river appears right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 2 verse 14, where it is described as one of the rivers that watered paradise. Genesis 15 verse 18 is another verse that mentions this river, saying, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. God made an incredible promise, stating that Abraham's descendants would have a vast land, stretching from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. This is mentioned several times as a kind of boundary of the promised and conquered lands, especially in the times of famous characters like David. In the book of Deuteronomy, right at the beginning, there is a promise made by God to the Israelites. He promised to give them all the lands located between the Euphrates River and the Mediterranean Sea. This is a promise of a vast territorial expanse. This is described in Deuteronomy 1 verse 7, Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites, Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. At another point, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet uses the Euphrates as a symbol to represent the Assyrian Empire. This empire was seen as a threat of invasion to Israel, giving the river a symbolic meaning of danger and adversity. This passage can be found in Isaiah 8 verses 7 to 8, where it says, Therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty and many waters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria and all his glory. It will rise over all its channels and overflow all its banks. It will sweep into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. The other reason the whole world is concerned about the relationship between the Euphrates River and the Apocalypse is because the Bible itself reveals intriguing predictions about the future of the Euphrates. Specifically, it is mentioned twice that this river will one day dry up. One of these predictions is in the Book of Revelation, a section filled with symbolism that has sparked a wide range of interpretations over the centuries. First, in Revelation 9 verse 14, it all starts with a trumpet sound, it's very much in the style of the end times, you know? Here, an angel receives a very specific command, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. It sounds like something out of a movie, with angels waiting for their cue to enter the scene. Then, in Revelation 16 verse 12, we have another dramatic scene. This time, an angel is pouring out a bowl, which is like one of the last major acts that occur in this sequence of intense events. And what does he do? He dries up the Euphrates. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. This is done to prepare the way for some kings coming from the east. It seems that this river, by drying up, is paving the way for something very grand and decisive. It's important for you to know that some people avoid this book due to its disturbing content, while others dedicate themselves to exploring its prophecies in detail. 
An interesting fact is that Revelation suggests that there are special blessings for those who read its words aloud, meditate on them, and incorporate them into their lives. This is mentioned right at the beginning, in Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. However, it is emphasized that altering the text, whether by additions or omissions, will result in specific curses. Adding to the text may result in suffering the plagues described in the book, while removing parts of the text may result in the loss of the right to eternal life in the New Jerusalem. In chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, we can see what will happen in the future that seems to be just around the corner. Revelation is a book full of symbolism and divided in a way that helps us better understand the message. The first five chapters talk about what is happening now, from 6 to 16, they explore this near future, and from 20 to 22, they take a peek even further into the distant future. In this scenario of future events, the Euphrates River is not just a river, it plays a very important role in the forthcoming events, which are represented in a very symbolic way with three series of signs the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. These symbols represent disasters and judgments that will occur, and are so intense that, without intervention, they could end human life on earth. But, even in the face of so many intense revelations, the message that comes along is that it won't be as bad as it seems. There is a promise that, in the end, it will not go beyond what is already predicted in these scriptures. Before we continue and understand in depth these disturbing revelations about the Euphrates River, just check if you're already subscribed to the channel and like the video if you are a faithful Christian committed to the Word of God. Revelation is like a puzzle full of metaphors, seals, trumpets, bowls, candlesticks, dragons, stars, each with a deep meaning about the end times. And there is a reminder, echoing from the book of Mark, that says, although the suffering will be intense, it will be shortened for the sake of the chosen ones, thus ensuring salvation. Mark 13, verses 19 and 20. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened those days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. In this first part of the verse, there is a very important message that often goes unnoticed, which is the following, despite everything seeming bleak, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. God, knowing the situation and severity of the events that will occur during the Great Tribulation, decided to shorten these difficult days. He did not do this without reason, but because of some special people, the Chosen Ones, whom He wants to ensure are saved. This means that, even if things get extremely difficult, they won't last that long, all to ensure that these people have a chance to get through it all without losing hope. So, what Jesus is saying is that, even though the Great Tribulation will be an extremely challenging period, there's no need to panic. God is in control, and He has adjusted the timetable to take care of those He has chosen to save. It's a message that, while warning about difficult times, also brings a promise of protection and care. Continuing, the verse says the following. God will shorten those days, and the seven bowls, also known as the final judgments of the tribulation period, will be the most severe judgments the world has ever witnessed. These seven bowls of God's wrath are detailed in Revelation 16, verses 1 to 21, and are specifically called, the seven bowls of God's wrath. Imagine we've reached a point where things have really spiraled out of control, and now it's time to face divine consequences. First, there's this situation where people who followed a very wrong path, supporting the Antichrist, begin to suffer from terrible sores. It's as if the first of the seven last plagues is targeting them specifically, as a very painful warning. Then, things get even more intense. Imagine the sea turning to blood, like a scene from a fantasy movie, but much more terrifying, because all marine life dies. And it doesn't stop there, as rivers and water sources also turn to blood. It's as if water, essential for life, turns against humanity. Now, think about the sun, which gives us light and warmth, turning into an enemy, scorching people with unbearable heat. And then, the land of the beast plunges into deep darkness, adding more suffering to this sequence of apocalyptic events. Behold the sixth plague, the great river Euphrates dries up. This isn't just a geographical detail. 
In ancient times, people saw the Euphrates as a natural barrier against invasions. When it dries up in Revelation, it's as if it's opening a path for something big and possibly frightening coming from the east. This river, almost 3,000 kilometers long and quite wide, loses all its water, setting the stage for the final events of this challenging period. It's a story of epic proportions, showing that actions have consequences, and that, in this biblical scenario, nature and the entire cosmos are connected to the fate of humanity. Just imagine, the great river Euphrates transforms into a kind of dry superhighway, paving the way for massive armies from the east, think of countries like China, India, and Japan, all marching towards the west. It sounds like something out of an action movie, doesn't it? But, in fact, it's a scene described in the biblical prophecies about the end times. Now, why would this happen? Well, some say that this drying of the Euphrates is linked to the rise of a controversial figure, the Antichrist, whom many associate with Europe. And the story gets even more intense, the Antichrist will end up facing God directly. And all this tension culminates in an epic meeting, a gathering of leaders at a place called Armageddon. Curious, isn't it? The Bible tells us that an angel plays a key role in this, pouring out a bowl that symbolizes the wrath of God upon the Euphrates, drying it up. It's not climate change or human action, but a divine plan, setting the stage for the so-called kings from the east to arrive for a battle that is destined to happen. And this battle, Armageddon, is not just any battle. It occurs in a real place, Megiddo, but it also represents something bigger, it's as if it were the climax of all battles, a confrontation that could change everything. And today, when people talk about Armageddon, it's not just about the prophecy, sometimes they use this term to describe any massive conflict that seems to have the power to change the world or even end it. It's a story of gigantic proportions, with the fates of nations and beliefs colliding in an event that many believe will define the future of humanity. In the context of the Book of Revelation, the word Armageddon refers to the ultimate decisive conflict that will occur in the future between God and the forces of evil. But what does it really mean? Well, in Hebrew, Armageddon means Mount Megiddo, a real place that is the stage for an epic battle in the scriptures. Now, you'll only find the word Armageddon once in the Bible, in Revelation 16, where it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The story tells that from the dragon, that is, Satan, the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet emerge evil spirits that resemble frogs. These spirits have the power to perform miracles and convince world leaders to join together for a monumental confrontation against God. Then, in a breathtaking climax, Jesus returns and the great battle takes place. God's enemies are defeated in a scene described with details that make you wonder what it would be like to witness such an event. Jumping to Revelation 19, we find another description that many believe to be the same battle, where Christ, riding a white horse and accompanied by the heavenly armies, confronts and defeats the forces of evil led by the Antichrist. Imagine an imposing figure, with eyes that blaze like fiery flames and a head crowned with many royal crowns. He carries a mysterious name, known only to himself. Dressed in a robe dipped in blood, he is known as the Word of God. Sounds like the main character of an epic, doesn't it? Well, that's the description of a powerful scene from the Book of Revelation. Now, picture the heavenly armies, all dressed in fine, white, pure, and shining linen, following him on majestic white horses. The main character, with his powerful word, wields a sharp sword, not to cause chaos, but to bring order and justice, ruling the nations with resolve. He is the executor of divine justice, crushing the rebellion of the nations with the force of his wrath. And on his robe and on his thigh, a title is inscribed that declares his supreme authority, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In a subsequent scene, an angel appears, making a dramatic call to the birds of the sky to prepare for an unusual feast, feeding on the defeated in the great final battle. And then, the confrontation culminates, 
the beast and the false prophet, masters of deception, are defeated and thrown into the lake of fire. The remaining rebels fall by the sword that comes from the mouth of the one riding the white horse, and the birds feast. As for the location of this final battle, Armageddon, it is not a mountain peak but probably refers to the mountainous region around the plain of Megiddo, north of Jerusalem. A real place that becomes the setting for the ultimate showdown between good and evil, as depicted in this apocalyptic vision full of symbolism and meaning. Megiddo is a place full of stories, a true stage for epic battles throughout the ages, where troops from various nations, from Egyptians to Romans, even the forces of Napoleon, have clashed. Even during World War I, this area witnessed confrontations. And we cannot forget two significant biblical events that took place there, the tragic fall of King Saul and the death of King Josias. Now, imagine that this historic place will be the setting for the final act, where dark forces have manipulated world leaders, gathering their armies for a battle of epic proportions. In this scenario, the Antichrist emerges as a leader, but he won't be in control for long. Jesus Christ, along with the heavenly armies, will descend to earth, touching the Mount of Olives and claiming victory over evil. The final fate for the Antichrist and the false prophet? They will be thrown into the lake of fire, as Revelation tells us. And it doesn't stop there, Jesus will also bind Satan and initiate a reign of peace that will last a thousand years. Speaking of Armageddon, this is not just a battle, it's the climax of divine wrath, a pivotal point where everything wrong begins to be corrected, and celestial order is restored. It's a clash between good and evil with a cast that goes beyond our world, involving celestial and earthly beings. And how does all this begin? With the Euphrates River drying up, paving the way for this final confrontation that not only marks the end of an era but also the beginning of a new period of divine peace and justice. It's the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon, where good and evil will have their definitive showdown, opening the doors to a new chapter in the history of humanity. Thank you very much for watching the video until the end. Remember to leave a like, activate the notifications, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Until the next video, stay with God.